For the last three months, Ukraine has been rolling. At the beginning of September, the state of affairs looked like this, with Russia occupying most of Luhansk, about half of Donetsk, Zaporizhia about parallel to the Dnipro River, all of Kherson south of the Dnipro, and also Kherson City just across it, and let's not forget Crimea, still held since 2014. In September, Ukraine forced Russia to reinforce Kherson City, allowing it to run rampant in the north. In October, Ukraine refocused its efforts back to Kherson and slowly approached the city. In November, Russia calculated that its position north of the Dnipro was untenable, and thus retreated before Ukraine could rout the occupying forces. With those successes in the books, where does Ukraine go from here? Well, let's start with what Ukraine won't be doing. We can immediately cross Crimea off the list. This is just an obvious consequence of geography. Getting to the peninsula first requires going through the rest of Kherson. The core parts of Luhansk and Donetsk are also non-starters. These are the areas that Russian special forces helped to turn into separatist regions in 2014. In short, the trenches are literally dug in around them. There is a reason why the low-level conflict had more or less frozen over before February 2022, and why there were multiple failed attempts to negotiate a resolution. Ukraine will want to get to those places eventually, but Kyiv does not want to engage in a World War I-style trench battle when other options are available. That leaves a few options on the table for Ukraine. The first is to keep pressing down south. This may seem weird, given that the whole point of Russia's retreat was to amass a large force concentration behind an easily defendable geographic barrier. Across from Kherson City, the Antonovsky Bridge used to span more than 1,300 meters. Emphasis here on used to. During the retreat, a section was completely broken off, and other crossings are in various states of disrepair. Instead, there are whispers that Ukraine has made a landing along the Kinburn Spit. And yes, Spit is an actual name for a geographic feature. The point of this is obvious. It gives Ukraine a beachhead to threaten Russian forces from a different angle. And if they get deeper into the peninsula, it opens up new targets for artillery. This is how far Ukraine can spray HIMARS rockets given their position in Kherson City. And this is how far they can go if Ukraine advances to here. Notably, Crimea gets into range. But do not be confident that this is the real current target for Ukraine. Remember, the first round of counterattacks began by tying up Russian forces in the south while the real action was going on up north. And speaking of the north from a previous phase, there are still parts that Ukraine could take from Luhansk. The problem here is that such gains do not do much for the overall war plan. Even if Ukraine were to make progress like this, it does not open up a new vector for attack. The fortified sections of separatist-held Luhansk and Donetsk create a natural breakpoint. Of course, if Russia recognizes that, the defenses on the outer region may be less robust than compared to elsewhere. Again. Ukraine could play the game of take what they give you and be somewhat satisfied with it. More land is better than none, and capturing that land will help further limit resupply coming in from the north. That takes us to the third option, and the real strategic prize available to Ukraine, Zaporizhia. Or more precisely, anything down the middle of Russia's current land bridge to Crimea. The benefit here is that it cuts Russia's gains in two. And if Ukraine gets all the way to the Sea of Azov, Russia no longer has rail access to Kherson or Crimea. All of Russia's terrestrial resupply for those regions would then have to come from whatever the Crimean bridge can physically support, which hardly seems reliable at the moment. Russia also has the ferry system it restarted post-bridge attack. But let's not forget that the entire reason Russia built the bridge was because the ferries were insufficient. 
And that was during an era when it was just Crimea that Russia was resupplying, and during a period of peace, no less. Strategically, cutting down the middle would also open up a new line of attack into Kherson. Basically, all of the new defenses Russia has built to deter a river crossing are here. And unfortunately for Russia, they are rendered meaningless if Ukraine simply goes around. Even just getting a foothold down the middle would extend artillery coverage into other parts of Kherson and Crimea. Basically, Ukraine could repeat the same sort of artillery-based attrition that forced Russia out of Kherson city in early November, but just do it further south. There is also some direct consumption value for venturing just a little further north into Donetsk and retaking Mariupol. You will recall how this was a major turning point in the war when it fell back in May, following a long siege on an iron and steel plant. It's the biggest city by population under Russian control, so it would be a major win for Ukraine. The trick here is that Ukraine needs to be advancing at least somewhat as it goes south, and provide a steady barrage along its rear. If not, Ukraine risks putting itself directly into a Russian flank, which would be bad news for Kyiv. That problem is relatively easy to solve, and pales in comparison to the elephant in the room, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. With all the action having previously taken place in the north and the south, Zaporizhia has stayed out of the spotlight, except for the power plant. If you've heard of this region before, this is probably why. It is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, and the tenth largest in the world. The facility has six separate reactors, and was a crucial part of Ukraine's infrastructure before the war began. However, trouble emerged at the start of the conflict. On March 3rd, Russia took control of the power plant. By even fighting militarily to capture the facility, Russia risked damaging the power plant's electrical lines, cooling systems, and reactors. Fortunately, the worst the battle had to offer was a fire at a training facility. However, sporadic fighting since then has seen at various points the external power supply and the emergency generators destroyed. The lingering concern among nuclear oversight agencies is that there will ultimately be some sort of catastrophic accident, or intentional act, that causes the war to take on a nuclear dimension. Thus far, we have not yet hit the peak crisis potential. As long as Russia thinks it has a shot at holding the facility, it is not going to blow up the buildings. After all, the 5.7 gigawatts it used to produce provided electricity for more than a fifth of all Ukrainians. And by signing this very Russian law, Zaporizhia is a Russian power plant powering Russian homes, no different than the one in Kaliningrad. But if Russia does not see any long-term hope in controlling the area, then the entire power plant suddenly becomes expendable. The 1991 Gulf War provides a worrying parallel. The year before, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in an effort to capture the latter's oil fields. Kuwait's army was no match for Iraq, and the country quickly fell. However, the territorial change did not last long. Five months later, a US-led coalition expelled the Iraqi military from the country. But Saddam's forces did not go quietly. During their retreat, they set fire to Kuwait's oil wells. It was an environmental catastrophe, to say the least. This is what the view looked like from the space shuttle Atlantis. The final fire was not put out for nine months. But Saddam didn't care. If he couldn't have them, no one could. Back in Zaporizhia, the worry here is that Russia would execute a false flag operation, or just make the problem look like it was an accident or operator incompetence. If there is any silver lining here, it is that wrecking the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant would not be as catastrophic as you might think. When people hear nuclear disaster, 
they too often conjure up images of a power plant turning into a nuclear bomb with a full-on mushroom cloud. Fortunately, and take it from nuclear physicists here, that is literally impossible in this case. Uranium-based nuclear weapons require their fuel to be enriched to 90% concentration of the uranium-235 isotope. In contrast, Zaporizhia's VVER-1000 reactors run on 2.4 to 4.4% uranium-235. Uranium fission cannot occur fast enough to get the traditional nuclear explosion before all of the pieces get blown apart. The problem would also not be as bad as what happened at Chernobyl. After the International Atomic Energy Agency visited the plant in September, the reactors went into shutdown mode. That means they are no longer operating, and thus no longer creating new heat. Chernobyl, by contrast, had a meltdown and explosion precisely because too much energy was being created. Nevertheless, the plant still needs constant delivery of electricity to avert disaster. Once a reactor shuts down, the heat generated by the fuel rods immediately drops to just 6.5% of normal capacity. An hour later, it's down to 1.5%. And after a week, it's just 0.2%. The lower levels of what's called decay heat persist even with nuclear waste, because radioactive decay keeps things warm. And while fractions of a percent don't sound like much, normal operating temperatures of nuclear reactors are extreme. The end result is that spent fuel rods sit in pools of water well after they are taken offline. Conveniently, water is great at preventing radiation from reaching the surface. And as long as you keep cycling out that water and cooling it, the materials inside stay stable. Thus, the central problem is losing external power, having the on-site diesel backup generators fail, terminating the water cycle, boiling off what remains in the pool, and releasing radiation unconstrained. The good news is that Ukraine would witness this, and the problem would likely take days to unfold. As such, there would be some margin of error to evade the serious issues. But to add to the complication, remember the Kokovka Dam that many worried Russia would destroy during the escape from Kherson? Fortunately, Russia decided to not destroy that piece of infrastructure, and instead keep the water levels this high. One hopes that this willingness to keep infrastructure standing might extend to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. But these things are intertwined in a complicated way. Perhaps Russia's motivation is to keep the water level high enough at the dam for the Crimean Canal to function properly. The saving grace for Ukraine is that maintaining the canal also means maintaining high water levels back at Zaporizhia, which is necessary for the spent fuel pools to intake water from the river. Summing up, Ukraine has three main options. Continue attacking Kherson, aim for the edge areas up north, or split the Crimean land bridge and see what happens with Zaporizhia's nuclear power plant. Where do you think Ukraine is headed next? Let me know in the comments. If you want to know more about the war, you will love my book that explains the causes of it. Check below for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe and I will see you next time. Take care. Oh, and for those of you who celebrate Thanksgiving, here's Vladimir Putin supervising the opening of a turkey reproduction facility. I am not making this up. That is actually what's going on here.